Ladies and gentlemen, it's fantastic to have you with us today. My name is Annette Bohr, and I'm an Associate Fellow of the Russia Eurasia Program at Chatham House. And our focus today is, of course, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has scheduled its first parliamentary elections for 10th January 2021, so precisely a month from today. Authorities in Nur Sultan pledged to inject some dynamism into the political scene, yet those parties that could have represented a genuine opposition voice have nonetheless been locked out, they're still locked out, and the ruling Nurotan party is guaranteed to win a landslide victory. The election of former President Nazar Nazarbayev's handpicked successor last June, just it unleashed a wave of unusually large anti-government protests. And while Kazakhstan's election in January are unlikely to catalyze the sort of mobilization that we've seen recently in Belarus or Kyrgyzstan, the coordinated pressure that the government is currently exerting on civil society groups and activists uh, in the run-up to the elections indicates that Nur Sultan is nervous about holding these elections in the midst of such regional upheaval. So in this context, can we expect more protests, especially from a younger generation that is much more globalized? So in this discussion, we're going to aim to look at the upcoming event from the point of view of both the opposition and the authorities. Um, now, I'm very proud and pleased to say that we're holding this event in conjunction with the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, an organization that has done such an invaluable job of working with activists and journalism in Central Asia for the past 12 years. And I'll turn to my co-chair uh, today, Tony Borden, who is the executive director of IWPR in just a second. But before that, I'll introduce our speakers and I'll quickly address just a few administrative points very briefly. So we have three terrific presenters with us today, all of whom are based in Kazakhstan. Um, so we're in a position to get our reports directly from the field. We'll start with Shalkar Nusaitov, who's a political analyst based in Almaty, who will set the scene for us by outlining, among other things, the composition of the current parliament, which registered parties are competing in the elections, legislative changes, such as the introduction of a new and quite contentious law and the holding of rallies, and then providing an assessment to the extent that these top-down initiatives have or have not advanced any genuine reform. We'll follow that with, Shal we'll follow Shalkar with Asiem Japishava. Um, she's a journalist and political activist, also based in Almaty. She'll discuss the upcoming elections from the point of view of the opposition that has been locked out of the process despite promises of reform. And our last speaker is Danyar Kusenov, a political scientist who is based in Nur Sultan. And he will look at the upcoming elections in the context of the larger regional picture. So welcome to all of you and thank you for agreeing to join us today and to share your thoughts with us. So in the meantime, I'd like to welcome and introduce Tony Borden, IWPR's executive director, who will say a few words before we begin. Tony, over to you. Okay, hello everybody. And thank you so much to Annette. And I always uh, love to recognize and, and thank so much Abahan Sultanazarov and our, uh, the IWPR fantastic Central Asia team. Um, we're really looking forward to this discussion about the forthcoming elections, as you note, the risk of instability, what the meaning may be. Um, and I'm not going to repeat the already expert remarks that you have made and the comments that we're looking forward to hear. What I do want to do, though, of course, is express just how grateful we are, we are for this really wonderful relationship that we have and are building with Chatham House. It's a real honor for us to work with a group of such expertise and renown. Uh, you guys are just great. We've really enjoyed it. Um, and, uh, you know, we would be very happy if we could be together. That would be wonderful. But in this bizarre world that we are in now, we get to take advantage of the magic of this technology and really knit together expertise, 
from local and international perspectives, which, which frankly, we would really not ordinarily do. So we're making the best of the circumstances uh, that we can. Um, I would note that we had an excellent discussion together with jointly with Chatham House in May. We talked about COVID-19 and the impact on Central Asia's development. We're also really excited to look forward to Lubitsa Polakova's uh, participation. I believe it's the uh, Assistant Director of the Russia and Eurasia Program at Chatham House as one of our speakers at the Kabar School of Analytics. And this relationship fits very well uh, into Auto Pairs programming. As Annette pointed out, we are very well known for many years working with media and civil society groups. Um, but under the uh, increasingly known branding of Kabar Central Asia, we have um, taken advantage of the real, um, uh, I have to say, impressive talent pool uh, and 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 in in and, 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 and uh, uh, ambition really of our Central Asian friends and colleagues to try to support analytical uh, thinking, analytical and policy analysis type of work at a higher level to contribute to um, governance and and specific uh, reform and change. So um, that's part that's the Kabar side of the Ida Pair work in Central Asia, and that's where the association with. Um, uh, Chatham House gives us a particular uh, pleasure. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the Zoom component brings us together and, and Ida Pierre's work always uh, in, in Central Asia focuses on a regional approach. All countries are individual, but there are a range of interconnected problems and challenges, and it's key to see um, their specificity, but also their interrelated uh, nature. So I'm sure we're going to have a very uh, enlightened, uh, challenging, and I hope uh, uh, fresh discussion this afternoon. Um, I would only finally mention, as I always love to do, that Ida Pairs programming in Central Asia is generously supported by our good friends at the uh, for, uh, foreign, foreign Ministry of Norway. And um, I'm not sure if any of our colleagues from there are on the line, but they really are a great partnership and so supportive and helpful of our work there. Annette, um, that's really all I wanted to say. Thank you so much to everybody. Welcome, enjoy, and back to you. Thank you very much, Tony. Shalkar, the, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you for organizers for making this event possible in this challenging time. So today I'd like to talk about Kazakhstan's political landscape on the eve of upcoming parliamentary elections. So let me begin with Tokayev's political reforms. Um, basically, Tokayev and his team have been very proud of their so-called political reforms, which uh, actually uh, really hard to call political reforms because they are uh, in fact uh, cosmetic changes to a couple of laws on elections, to the law on uh, peaceful assembly and to the law on political parties. And the, uh, the first uh, law, which actually was passed and signed by uh, Tokai uh, is the parliamentary opposition bill, which is actually uh, was uh, designed and promoted by Agjol party, which is another party represented in the current majlis. And the, basically the, this bill uh, gives Nrotan and the upper hand to choose a sanctioned rival in majlis. It's a main, uh, point uh, when it comes to this law. And second law, actually second um, reform, reform, uh, it's uh, related to the law on elections. Um, the main change, which is promoted as a sign of um, dem democratic liberalization, as a sign towards uh, democracy, is that 30% quota on party list for women and youth was uh, included to the law. But it's, it's, it's worth to mention that this is uh, required while re registration with Central uh, Election Commission. And another change which is uh, promoted as a reform is amendments to, to the law on peaceful assembly. And many experts on human rights uh, in Kazakhstan and international uh, experts basically uh, said that it's not the law which gives more freedom for people. It's basically um, cement, this law cemented um, the previous uh, changes, previous uh, amendments to the law and 
the main point of this argument uh, of the law is that only sanctions rallies are allowed. And the last uh, change, which is, uh, which has been named as reform, is amendments to law on political parties. And as you know, in Kazakhstan, it's really hard to register uh, with the Ministry of Justice as political party uh, because of many objective and other reasons. And the government basically saying that we uh, decrease the requirement for membership uh, threshold uh, from 40,000 to 20,000, and which is uh, still uh, have been promoted as the uh, change as a reform. So let's talk about the current measure list. Uh, today's measure list uh, is uh, represented by three, three political parties. First is Norotan, which has uh, 84 seats, then Aljol, seven seats, and Kazakhstan People's Party, the former the Communist People's Party of Kazakhstan, which has seven seats. And also we have nine seats uh, by the Assembly of People of Kazakhstan. And the Assembly of People of Kazakhstan is uh, headed by uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. So basically we can say that Nurotan has uh, 93, not 84 seats in Majlis. So let's discuss um, uh, political actors in the upcoming uh, elections. Uh, first, it's a Nurotan, which uh, recently presented its uh, party list, which consists of 126 candidates. And 77 of them was uh, picked uh, by the primaries. And 49 members uh, was given an opportunity to be on the list by Nurotan Central Office, uh, which includes Dariga Nazarbayeva, uh, Nurlan uh, Nibatulin, uh, Askar Mamin, and Koshanov, President Tokayev's uh, administration's uh, head of Tokayev President's administration. And uh, also, Nurotan has monopolized a new cycle since March 2020, when uh, the Kazakh government started uh, the first lockdown uh, in the middle of March. And the Nurotan launched um, the, the, the Bezberg Games campaign, which they framed as uh, support from the party uh, to um, impoverished uh, people. And Nazarbayev called uh, some oligarchs and other business people in Kazakhstan to join uh, this campaign. And since then, this campaign has been promoted um, as a uh, main campaign in Kazakhstan. Uh, to help the people in this challenging time of uh, in this challenging time of a pandemic, and also Boris Nemtsov uh, visited uh, several regions of Kazakhstan, but because of uh, coronavirus, he stopped his uh, tour over the country, and but his uh, visits to regions has been widely uh, covered by Nurotan's media and state owned media too. Uh, then primaries is also from August to October gave the Nurotan a chance to be um, in the spotlight. Recently, Tokayev announced uh, Nurotan's 21 trillion tenge election plan. And uh, it's also promoted as a, a big uh, plan to help uh, impoverished people, to help all people of Kazakhstan uh, to tackle with uh, their uh, uh, with the challenges of, uh, uh, of pandemia. And we will see uh, that campaigning, uh, we'll see that Baybek, Nazarbayev, Tokayev, and Akims will be campaigning for Nurotan over the next months. And another uh, political party which will take part in the election is Agjol. It's a Nurotan sanctioned rival number one. And party list uh, consists of 38 candidates, including Azad Pirwashev and Dania Yispaeva the first woman uh, candidate for president. Uh, and also, Arjol party has been, uh, has portrayed itself as a constructive opposition party. And it's worth to mention that it's led by former Rotan member, Azad Pirwashev. And potential, this party can be called a potential parliamentary opposition party in Majlis, because this law, the opposition party bill 
was designed and promoted by Avjol, and in particular by Azad Perwashik. And second sanctioned rival of Nortan is Kazakhstan's People Party, which is a form as a Kazakhstan's communist, uh, which is formerly the Communist Party. It's rebranded re itself uh, recently, and um, their uh, party list consists of 113 candidates. It's a big number. It's a second party after Nrotan, which has a big uh, list of uh, political party uh, candidates. And interestingly, it represents, uh, it's a diverse list. It represents people from all walks of life. Um, and this party in 2016 gained 7.18% of votes or seven seats. And the next sanctioned rival of Nrotan is uh, Aul party or the, the party, uh, the village in Kazakh. Uh, the party list consists of 19 candidates and the party posi positions itself as a party of hardworking farmers and villagers. And the, one of the, the activities is signing memorandum of understanding with professional associations over the last months, over the, over the past three months, and also sign of some of the political activities. Um, and it will be interesting to see how they work if they get some seats uh, in, in, in Majelis. Uh, so the next party is uh, Adal party. Um, this is a very interesting case because um, it has been, it's a formally known as Berlek party, which has been very dormant in the previous elections. It took part in uh, uh, last uh, parliamentary election and gained only 1% of votes. And the, this party list consists of 20 candidates. And recently it recruited Kazakh speaking sport, media and social media celebrities. And it's, to, it's worth to mention that this party led by Timur Kulubayev's Nazarbayev's son in law's uh, close ally, Sirik Sultan Gadiev. And another uh, interesting fact that um, recently Eldar Jumagaziev, uh, which is another, it's one of the candidates from this Adel party, uh, said, Our rivals in these upcoming elections are Akjol and Aul. So he did mention Nurotan, the main political. Uh, power in Kazakhstan as a rival. Mm -hmm. So they're basically uh, uh, going to challenge Aul and Anjou. Um, so to sum up my points, the, the upcoming elections in Kazakhstan can be called the Tokayev, the Nazarbayev Tokayev regime sanctioned elections because of the following reasons. First of all, in Kazakhstan currently, only sanctioned rallies allowed and only sanctioned political rivals in Nurotan allowed to take part in the elections. And only sanctioned organizations are allowed to uh, conduct opinion polls, and only sanctioned uh, organizations allowed to do exit polls. And it basically shows the uh, the main the main picture is here is that uh, the Nur Sultan is very nervous of the upcoming elections because of upheavals in uh, neighboring countries in the region. Also. They are nervous of because of the fact that last year, um, the many people, thousands of Kazakhstani people, showed up and took to, to the streets after the presidential election. Um, but in my view, in this time um, in January, we'll not see such kind of um, uh, num big numbers of people taken to the streets uh, because there is no uh, political party is trying to capitalize on uh, popular discontent with the government or Nurotan. It's a main reason I get, uh, in my view, is that uh, we'll not have such kind of scenarios that we have seen uh, in Belarus, in, in, in Kyrgyzstan. And also um, Kazakhstan is a different story because of um, different factors. And I'm sure that we'll discuss um, after the, uh, my colleagues' presentations Thank you very much, Shalkar, for that uh, terrific scene setting introduction. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned the rebranded Berlik party, which is now Adal and led by Timur Kulubayev. And um, a recent report showed that both Adal and Nur Atan are actually registered to the same address. 
Um, and another interesting point from your presentation that I took is while you can argue that the bill that ensures that 30% that of seats go to women and young people is a nice gesture, the bill's promising to empower alternative political parties um, is just cosmetic. And indeed the one on the, the amendments to the law and peaceful assembly, um, despite these amendments, it's actually harder than ever to hold a rally and it still must be sanctioned. So uh, these are really important points that I'm sure we'll, we'll come to more in the Q&A. And now I'd like to turn to Assem, who, as I stated before, is an, is an activist and can present us the, uh, the vantage point of the opposition. So Assem, the floor, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Annette, for this kind introduction. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, good evening. Uh, yep, as a political activist and as a journalist who covers uh, human rights and politics in Kazakhstan, I will be talking about our opposition, uh, about Kazakh opposition. So, um, as Annette uh, rightly pointed out, uh, the main question, uh, the, the main question for this election is isn't is not um, is. The main question for, for the Kazakh opposition for this election is to actually gather people on the streets because uh, the, the one thing first and that, that should be that should, we all should understand that there was no prospect. Uh, there was never a prospect that actual opposition groups will be allowed in parliament. Uh, in fact, uh, it's been 15 years since the last political party uh, in Kazakhstan was actually registered. Uh, but before I uh, get to this uh, point, let me um, let me talk about uh, Kazakh opposition and uh, the, let me just you know um, introduce you to uh, the state of Kazakh opposition uh, on uh, for 2020. So for now we have three major groups in our opposition. The first group is a formal opposition. Um, it's been exact, it's been, it's been since uh, 18 months since Tokai formally took over presidency in our country and, uh, and his formal and cosmetic uh, reforms with uh, formal opposition. So for now we have, as um, my colleague uh, Shalkar, um, uh, has introduced to you, uh, we have Akjol, and we have uh, this newly uh, renovated parties like uh, ex-communist party, which is, now, uh, is, which is now is called the People's Party. And we have uh, Berlik uh, that, you know, um, it's been dead for the last four years, but now it's renovated again, and now it's called Adal. And yes, it's uh, the leaders of this party are have very close ties to Timur Kulibayev, who is uh, son-in-law of Nazarba Nazarbayev's son-in-law. Uh, so uh, here we have Adal and a um, few other parties, uh, which are uh, which you all know. And also uh, with Adal, they, as you know, they refuse to disclose their funding sources. Uh, but uh, party leaders uh, are this party is registered at the same address as Nurotan, so there is no uh, question uh, about their funding. So here we have all this uh, uh, formal opposition, and then the second group is the Gongo opposition. Uh, I remember that Annette, I think you mentioned uh, Yeltriege and Oran uh, and few other movements. Uh, there, these are Gongo organizations in Kazakhstan. They uh, and in Kazakhstan, you can easily, you know, uh, see if uh, this movement or this party is 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 uh, you know um, uh, independent or a Gongo uh, from what they propose. And all the Gongo organizations, they usually uh, propose uh, social reforms rather than you know, political reforms. They always talk about social reforms. They always talk about uh, economic, pro economic problems and uh, other things. And here, and then we have the third group, uh, the, the smallest, uh, which is a, like a real opposition. So here we have all these groups 
uh, that are planning on uh, protesting on the 16th of December and on the election day. Uh, it's uh, Jamulat Mamayev's Democratic Party. It's uh, Ablyazov's um, uh, Democratic Choice of, Kaz uh, of Kazakhstan. But with Ablyazov, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. I will uh, talk about it later. And then we have Wayan Kazakhstan and a few other groups. And I am with, I'll be protesting with those groups on the 16th and on the 10th of uh, January. So with uh, Ablyazov's uh, Democratic, uh, Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan, which is um, you know, considered extremist in, uh, by our um, authorities, uh, they uh, decided to, for this election state, they have decided to um, implement uh, this so-called um, smart, um, this strategy, which is called smart vote. Uh, we, uh, they're trying to implement the same thing that as they did in Russia. So they are urging people to vote for any other party um, than Nurotan. But it's, it isn't working because uh, when Muhtar Ablazov urged uh, his followers to vote for um, nationwide Social Democratic Party, they uh, withdrew themselves from the elections. And when he, uh, when he uh, called his people to vote for um, Agjol, uh, they, I think they stopped, uh, uh, I think they just like physically uh, stopped working on that day. So it is quite interesting with uh, Ablazov and his strategy for the uh, for these elections. And I totally agree with Shalkar. Um, if we talk about uh, all these um, protests that are coming uh, next week and in January, I don't think, uh, and I'm being realistic that we will have a lot of people on the streets uh, because uh, uh, First of all, these elections will be held uh, in on 10th of January, which is you know new, you know New Year is a big thing in Kazakhstan, so people will be at home. It's winter, it's cold, um, and the second reason is that it's not uh, uh, to to be honest, it's not it's not a very big thing in Kazakhstan. Uh, we haven't had. Um, you know the the the, the interest the interest of um, public uh, isn't very big with these elections, so I don't think uh, the opposition will be able to gather um, more than 100, 200 people on the streets, and it wouldn't be it won't be nationwide as well. So uh, that's the second thing, and I think that. Um, to gather people, to for people to go, to actually go on the streets and to protest, there should be, um, you know, we have two triggers that usually work. First trigger was uh, that when Nazarbayev stepped down, it was last spring. And the second reason that uh, for people to actually protest will be, might be uh, economical reasons. So uh, you know that COVID, uh, hit our economy pretty bad. So if there will be any protests, uh, they um, will be connected with, uh, you know, with, with money, not with politics. Because generally our um, Kazakhstani people are not very interested in that, such kind of things. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Osem, for that. Uh, interesting that you note, as did Shalkar, that the opposition protests uh, appear to be, that they will be quite contained. Um, so I'm sure we'll discuss that more later as well. And it was also interesting to hear how the parties are already now working to organize protests um, for the 16th and also at the time of the elections. So we'll turn now to our final speaker, Danya Kusenov. Um, Daniel, the, f the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for invitation to be a speaker at this great event. Um, first of all, let me disagree on the name of this uh, discussion. I wouldn't call this as a post-Nazarbayev era. 
yeah. uh, because at least two persons with another by surname, uh, one of the main actors uh, for these elections. Uh, so I think it's too early to call uh, this time as a post Nazarbayev era, as um, Nazarbayev still concentrates uh, a lot of power in his hands. And um, uh, what's interesting for these elections, uh, it's of, of course, for a reason of uh, nervousness uh, for the authorities uh, because of the political unrest in, um, in post-Soviet countries, such as Belarus and Kyrgyzstan. And um, uh, I would like to focus uh, more on this and try to compare um, the prospects for, for the political unrest in Kazakhstan after, uh, after these elections um, in comparison with uh, Belarus and Kyrgyzstan events. Uh, first of all, if we will compare uh, with Belarus, um, uh, it's obvious that Belarus is a neighboring country for EU and the influence of the international actors and especially uh, European actors is much greater in Belarus than in Kazakhstan. And for Kazakhstan being stuck between uh, Russia and China um, uh, doesn't put uh, Kazakhstan in a favorable position for some kind of um, involvement of other international actors other than these two great powers. And um, what's um, another point uh, which is different in, in, um, than in Belarus, uh, what already Shalkar has uh, already mentioned about the um, absence of the opposition party uh, uh, that is contesting for uh, for, for these elections. Uh, for Belarus, uh, it was clear that Tikhanovska um, was a symbol of the Belarus opposition. And um, we also observed the unprecedented solidarity among the opposition, uh, opposition uh, forces uh, in the country. And we don't have um, such thing in Kazakhstan. Even uh, during the last uh, presidential elections, uh, it was Kasanov who has played this uh, decorative opposition role, but um, at least he he could mo mobilize uh, some, uh, some protesters uh, to be on the streets, but he has admitted uh, uh, and uh, accepted uh, their election results, uh, even though the independent observers um, who managed to get the protocols uh, from from their president election uh, commissions, uh, they uh, in the most cases they prove that Kasanov has won uh, in this uh, in these districts. Uh, so we don't have. Um, such figure in Kazakhstan, not in terms of personality, or, nor in terms of uh, institu institution like uh, political party. And um, what I would like uh, uh, also would like to mention that um, uh, that um, weather conditions uh, during the protests in Belarus and Kazakhstan were much favorable. Uh, rather than in Kazakhstan, especially uh, now during the winter months, um, it's uh, a minimal likelihood of the people, especially in North Sultan or eastern parts of, or northern or eastern parts of uh, Kazakhstan, will be protesting in, and um, we don't expect much gatherings uh, during this uh, period of time. For for the authorities, uh, it's obviously the best time to uh, to conduct the relations. And also, I would like to to point out to the fact that um, during the Belarus um, protest, uh, it was um, uh, it was a mem 
I'll, I'll say, and it was uh, uh, highly widespread about um, the phrase uh, Sasha 3% based on the polls uh, and the actual support of Lukashenko. And what if we compare with Kazakhstan, uh, we have really limited space for, for research and sociological institutions uh, to conduct any polls, exit polls, or any kind of research and to be widespread um, uh, throughout the Kazakhstan. And um, we already have uh, some polls results, uh, but they are uh, but they are questionable and they are put Nuratan in a very favorable position, uh, giving them uh, 70 plus uh, percent of the support. And according to them, I've just recently received um, uh, some data from the Central Asia Barometer. And according to their polls, uh, Nuratan party has only 30% of support um, as of now. And if we compare with the 74% uh, um, in uh, 2017, um, so we see this drastic uh, drop uh, in terms of support this part here. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's pretty much uh, all for the Belarus, but for the Kyrgyzstan, uh, I would like to say that um, the Kyrgyzstan has a, a really vibrant civil society and Kyrgyzstan alone has uh, as many uh, NGOs as um, in all Central Asian countries combined. And uh, Kyrgyzstan also has um, um, has um, experience uh, in in the revolutions in 2010, 2015. Uh, so it's uh, not the same as uh, with the Kazakhstan, where the people mostly, um, as a code in the psychology, it uh, has uh, experience in this learned helplessness. And um, they don't really see that uh, their political actions or protests could lead to significant changes in the political landscape. And um, yes, and uh, also for, um, for the Kyrgyzstan, I would also like to mention that um, Kyrgyzstan is more dependent on the international and foreign aid. So the international organizations and the um, Western normative power has uh, more influence over the um, politics in, in, in Kyrgyzstan. And we couldn't say about uh, the same for, for the Kyrgyzstan or for, for Kazakhstan. And um, uh, in my opinion, this um, election would be another uh, boring uh, elections. And so what could be interesting to observe only in the lens of the power distribution um, there are so many discussions in Kazakhstan about the struggle on the hidden struggle between the Nazarbayev and Tukayev. Uh, so for maybe so maybe it would be interesting to see who will be the speaker uh, of the Majulis uh, after the elections and to see how this power will be dis redistributed because uh, many believe that uh, after Dariga was um, on step down from the position of the speaker of the senate if she's trying to get back to the power uh, so yes in this regard it will be interesting to observe but in terms of um, um in terms of the contest between uh, the parties uh, i wouldn't say it's, it's too much uh to look after because uh, it's um um it's it will be uh, in many terms, orchestrated from the um, Nurotan and authorities. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Danya. You, you alighted on so many topics of interest, and in particular, the ways that Belarus and Kyrgyzstan differ from uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, I noticed that you also mentioned the timing of the elections. And it, it's interesting to note that this is the first time in 16 years that elections are actually taking place at the end of parliament's five-year term. Uh, normally, they're, they're called much earlier. But perhaps the authorities reason that protests are, are less likely in the midst of winter and also that the pandemic can be used to justify a ban on political rallies. 
Um, so there's a lot to discuss here. I'll, I'll move to the Q&A session now, after again thanking the speakers for their presentations. Um, Asem, um, I, I would like to direct the first question to you, um, because it's, it's interesting to note that in all of this, the ability of fugitive former banker Mukhtar Ablazov to continue to involve himself in Kazakhstani politics from abroad and to affect the political scene is, is remarkable. Um, last month, he, it's, it's very confusing. I mean, last month he called on his supporters to vote for the nominal opposition party OSDP in order to take away votes from Neurotom, after which the OSDP announced that they were boycotting the whole affair. Um, then, not long after that, we hear that Ablazov is, is urging his supporters to vote for Akjol, arguing that this approach would make it easier to expose um, any sort of rigging that the um, authorities might, might employ. Um, and the result of this is that Akjol has now declared a temporary freeze on the acceptance of its new members. So it just struck me that despite all three of our speakers saying that protests in January are very likely to be contained for a number of very good reasons. Still, you have this, this political actor outside of Kazakhstan who's, who's really creating quite a bit of mayhem. And um, I'd be very interested to hear the views of the speakers on this, perhaps starting with SM, since you brought it up in your, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Um, I mean, on the, on the one hand, uh, of, of course, Ablazov uh, urged his followers to vote for Akjol now, uh, since OSDP decided not to uh, to boycott uh, the elections. But I don't think uh, he that um, DP, uh, DCK and Ablazov will be able to you know um, to generate the protest votes. Uh, first of all, because we never had fair elections in Kazakhstan, and now uh, since last week. Uh, the government issued this new decree and uh, which, you know, um, has a lot of limitations for, uh, for the uh, poll watchers, vote watchers. Now we cannot, uh, they cannot, uh, you know, um, uh, they, they cannot work, uh, at, they, they cannot watch the, this vote, this election as they did uh, back in 2019. They have a lot of limitations. So that's the first reason uh, I think uh, these elections would, they won't be uh, fair. So even if uh, Ablazov or someone else uh, would generate uh, this, you know, protest votes, uh, there is no way we will will be able to find out about it ever. And the uh, uh, second thing is, mm, I know that for uh, Ablazov might seem like um, you know uh, the the main uh, opposition figure, but um, I think uh, Jambulat Mamai. Uh, I, I think he's the in terms of the number of uh, followers, Jambulat Mamai is more. Uh, powerful at the moment because he's uh, he was able to gather all this um, you know Kazakh speaking people uh, all the people who protested back in 2016 uh, against um, against um, uh, Kazakh lands to you know uh, to selling Kazakh lands to foreigners and all these protests, all these people, they gathered around uh, Jambulat Mamai. So I think he has more chances to uh, to create this protest rather than um, Ablazov, who has also, uh, because he's a personal enemy of Nusultan Nazarbayev uh, and uh, his uh, movement, this uh, democratic choice of Kazakhstan is um, called extremistic. Uh, extremist organization uh, for his followers it is very hard to you know uh, do anything they always get the uh, strict uh, they, they, they always get all this uh, attention from the from our authorities so it's quite hard for them to for him to do so Thank you, Asa. Mm -hmm. um, Ondar or Shalkar, would either of you like to just add anything on what we're now calling the Ablazov effect? It was interesting to note that Asem that he said that he's not nearly as popular as Mamai, for example, but nonetheless, he does seem to have quite an effect. Danyar or Shalkar? Basically, I agree with Asem. Uh, and mm -hmm. in my view, as any authoritarian regime, the Kazakh government will use 
three pillars of uh, a serotonin genes. So the first one is co-optation, second one is um, repression, and last one is leg legitimization. And when it comes to uh, protests uh, aftermath of elections, um, I'm pretty sure that the Kazakh government will use uh, all available repression tools to keep people silent. And of course, uh, followers of Mukhtar Ablyazov uh, and other opposition groups will take to the streets and they'll, they'll try to make their voice, voices heard. But I'm very skeptic that their voices will be heard by the majority of people uh, in Kazakhstan. And the government also will use um, Norotan, Norotan and its uh, five, uh, four sanctioned rivals uh, to legitimize uh, the uh, election results as uh, they did uh, uh, with the help of uh, Amrjan Kosanov and the National uh, uh, National Council on Public Trust. So they'll, they'll use the same, in the same way, uh, the Norotani sanctioned rivals and uh, after mass of the elections, the, they'll give them a microphone and to calm down the people and they will also use the repression tools um, against um, followers of Jambalot Mamai and uh, uh, Dr. Abelaz. Thank you, Shalkar. Um, Danyar, I had one more question for you before turning to the chat, um, in particularly your parallels with Belarus, and, and you outlined quite, quite clearly why the situation is different, despite the fact that there are definite parallels. I mean, insofar as the executive controls powerful security services, journalists are restricted, civil society activists are restricted, there's a pliant judiciary, I mean, there are plenty of parallels to be found. Um, but the Kazakh Kazakhstani activists have been inspired and consulted with counterparts in Belarus to create an electoral fraud tracking platform, what is known as Golis in Belarus. And um, I, I thought that was quite an interesting development. And do you think that there's that this similar website that's currently being developed in Kazakhstan will, will have any real impact? It was a case actually during the presidential elections that um, Kazakhstani activists uh, try to collect um, all the protocols uh, that uh, independent observers managed to collect and to put in, uh, on the map. But um, uh, what is, uh, I think, different that um, um, uh, in essence, uh, the uh, political activists in Belarus, they are more experienced and they, uh, they have uh, quite strong support um, from diaspora living uh, in in Poland, in Lithuania, and they have uh, youth. Uh, I would say uh, I don't have uh, exact numbers, but I would say that uh, the Belarus youth uh, they more exposed uh, to their Western uh, and uh, values that. Uh, and uh, for Kazakhstan, I would say uh, the Kazakhstan activists, uh, even though uh, we could create uh, some platforms or some mechanisms, and it's still um, a lot of uh, work to do in terms of uh, in terms of uh, civil society development in the country. And uh, maybe for Kazakhstan, uh, it's just the beginning uh, to accumulate uh, and uh, to exchange. Uh, uh, best practices uh, in terms of uh, 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 in, in, in terms of um, uh, development of the uh, of the youth movements uh, between different countries. Uh, and uh, as of now, I, I would say that um, it's a good sign uh, for for Kazakhstan and as well for Belarus because. Um, uh, I would say that um, maybe two or three years ago, it was not really common uh, to um, to really observe developments in the neighboring countries. Uh, most of the uh, um, articles and the research uh, was uh, really based on the best practices uh, far away uh, from from Kazakhstan. And now uh, I think uh, 
it's a good chance uh, uh, to accumulate uh, this experience and uh, to learn from from the neighboring countries uh, mm -hmm. with um, with a similar po uh, political context. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Your, your response dovetails very nicely with an interesting question that we have coming in from Alex Folks, who says that the Kazakhstan elections are taking place on the same day as those in Kyrgyzstan. And how much news crosses the border between the two countries? And can we expect any events that take place in Kyrgyzstan, particularly if they involve protests, to influence the election in Kazakhstan? What is your view on that, Tanya? Based on the um, you know, previous experience, uh, that uh, Kazakhstan will likely close the borders uh, if uh, something uh, violent uh, will happen in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, to prevent uh, uh, to prevent the people to come uh, to Kazakhstan during uh, these uh, turbulent times. And um, in terms of um, uh, media news uh, penetration. Um, from from Kyrgyzstan to Kazakhstan, it's uh, um, it's less information that are coming from Kyrgyzstan to Kazakhstan rather than from Kazakhstan to Kyrgyzstan, and um, and um, it's also because for them for it still we have uh, blocked websites Kyrgyz websites for instance Club KG. Uh, uh, we still have uh, this uh, news uh, media resource blocked and Limon uh, KG as well. And, um, but for, for Kyrgyzstan, they are, uh, they are lucky to have all the media resources available for them uh, to consume all their uh, objective information uh, from Kazakhstan. And for uh, authorities in Kazakhstan, they are also trying to monitor all the uh, uh, news articles or the or the media presence of the Kyrgyz media uh, in in Kazakhstan, and they try to filter uh, all this uh, information and try to get only the negative side of the um, of the protests and uh, in in the neighboring country. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, all of this uh, effort that the authorities are going to to filter, to block, to to have certain parties boycott, and yet the end result is that um, all of you seem to be of the opinion that the protests will be very limited in in January. Um, so that's a bit of an interesting contradiction. Um, I wanted to turn to a little bit of a different topic now, and that is one that is a perpetual interest, and that's the figure of Dariga Nazarbayeva. Uh, we have a question, how should we interpret the fact that Dariga is running? I mean, indeed, can we say that this is her return to her big return to politics? Can we expect that she will head one of the committees? or become a deputy speaker or even the speaker of the Majlis in, in future. Um, Shalkar, would you like to, to jump in on this question? Dariga might uh, get the post of uh, Majlis speaker, but personally, I'm very skeptic about this uh, scenario. Um, if she was um, chosen as a potential speaker, we would have seen uh, some uh, media promotions and recently, um, after she was removed from the Senate Speaker post, uh, she was silent um, and she did not appear in the media. So I'm personally, I'm very skeptic. And it, based on the previous uh, experience, we can say that heavy, political heavyweights also uh, uh, were on the Northern Sparta list in 2016. But in the aftermath of uh, elections, they did not take um, uh, seats in Majlis. So they might use um, the names as a um, political tool uh, to uh, promote uh, the party list uh, to, uh, in order to get media attention, in order to uh, get some discussion uh, on the party list. So, um, if she'll come back to politics, um, she, uh, I'm, uh, I think that she is very interested to take the post of speaker, but she, she's already uh, held the post of Senate speaker. 
And by the constitution, uh, Senate Speaker is the second person um, in Kazakhstan's politics. And um, in my view, uh, I'm very skeptical that she will not be uh, in my list. And I guess like she was uh, put, her name was put on the list just to uh, get um, media, media attention and to have some such kind of conversation. All right, all right. Uh, Sam, we, this would be a question directed to you from uh, Slamjar Ahmedjarov. Um, and that is namely that recently the Central Election Committee of Kazakhstan has prohibited observers from taking pictures and making videos on election day. Uh, will this initiative have impact on the outcomes of the elections, do you think? Uh, yes, of course. And uh, not only they prohibited uh, them from taking pictures and making videos, they also, um, uh, the, the, there, there is new rule uh, that uh, does not allow all the uh, independent organizations to actually uh, watch, uh, the, to actually participate in the elections. And among them, uh, MIS, Kandir Kandakhanate, and all the other, you know, uh, independent uh, organizations that uh, have been watching all the previous elections. So I think it will uh, have a very uh, quite big impact um, on the fairness of these elections. And uh, we, you know, last year when we had uh, our elections last year, um, the government had a lot of our authorities had a lot of problems with um, with the watchers because uh, there there have been a lot of videos and all the materials that showed that uh, those elections weren't fair. So yes, I think um, that's what they're trying to do. And uh, moreover, um, we are uh, with a couple of other journalists. We are working on this um, new piece on uh, these elections and we had a few conversations with people who work uh, uh, on this uh, for this committee and for, for the government and they uh, told us uh, anonymously they shared this information that uh, they are the authorities are very scared of uh, the um, Belarus scenario to you know to happen in Kazakhstan and they are very, um, they have all this, uh, th this year, uh, they, 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 they warned them uh, to, you know, to be very, very strict with all the watchers and with journalists and with everyone. And they uh, even, you know, um, uh, scared them with some sanctions. So mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. might answer your question. Uh, th this again goes back to the same question. When Nazarbayev finally stepped down, there mm -hmm. were promises of change and, and the population was led to believe that there would be change. And when this was not forthcoming, we could almost say that the genie was let out of the bottle. And um, one would think that it'd be really difficult to put this genie back into the bottle now that it's been let out. And um, again, we witnessed the, the unusual spate of protests last year. Um, and yet all of you are saying that you don't think that there's really much hope for, for large scale protests. Um, yet, on the other hand, the, the government is very nervous. So just returning to this question again, which we have, um, from a, a listener, are there any possibilities for widespread prote protest movements in Kazakhstan in the aftermath of the elections? Or would you simply say that in the absence of a united party, a united opposition party, that there really are no prospects at this point? Would you rule this out? Uh, any of you, Asem, Shalkar, Danyar? Yeah, uh, so I already said that um, I personally see uh, almost no prospects for the mass gatherings uh, in Kazakhstan and uh, for, for these uh, elections. And um, we don't have, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, suppression of the protest activities, uh, Kazakhstan authorities are quite uh, successful. And um, what I also uh, wanted to, to add that, um, uh, it was quite recent for Jean Hosein um, massacre 
um, uh, nine years ago, and the people are really afraid, and uh, um, the protesters um, um, they understand uh, that the authorities uh, could go really far away uh, in terms of um, um, in terms not only to beat protesters or but also uh, to be more violent. Um, and we, uh, uh, yeah, as a, as a, for the ordinary citizens, um, I would say that people are really afraid of the, uh, of the outcomes of going to the streets and um, they know the uh, authority stakes uh, for the power and so they can go really far away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, thank you very much, Danyar. Um, a question from Abu Khan Sultan Nazarov uh, to, to anyone who feels they would like to respond to it. Uh, Shalkar, uh, you were talking about silencing people. Do you see civic space actors as a potent actor in modernizing the electoral process in the country? Uh, does it hold power or what can be done to strengthen civic and democratic space is the question. Um. Unfortunately, Kazakhstan doesn't have a history of political process. We had a, pro a big protest, mass pro protest in 2016 uh, because of uh, land reforms. And after that, we had a last year after the presidential election. And uh, there's some um, similarities between these two main uh, uh, political uh, protests. First, it was uh, organized um, actually in 2016 uh, most of the people who take who took part in uh, in land reform protests they were Kazakh speaking people in uh, in Kazakh speaking areas like in Atrau uh, in Kozlorda in South Kazakhstan region um, and second thing that um, Kazakh speaking uh, political activists can gather more people uh, in recent years in Kazakhstan. In 1990s and in, in 2010s, uh, Russian-speaking political activist leaders in Almaty, they were the main uh, figures uh, in terms of um, uh, organizing, in terms of uh, attracting more people in their rallies. And the demographics are playing a great role in these terms. And also uh, Kazakh-speaking people um, are the majority of people living in Kazakhstan and they are impoverished uh, in comparison to uh, people living, Russian speaking people living in uh, cities. And also we'll see that um, young people, particularly Kazakh speaking people, uh, after coming from small cities, from villagers to big cities like Astana and Almaty, they try to stay in the city, in, in, the, in these two big cities and uh, to have their own families there. And the main uh, their uh, goal is to find a good job with a good salary. And they are not interested about their political rights. They're basically interested about uh, winning a bread on their table. And uh, I guess in order to have a civic society, which uh, will uh, have very politically active position um, during elections, we need to have um, uh, people with um, stable uh, earnings. We need to have uh, middle class uh, in general terms. And then we might see some uh, active and uh, permanent uh, protests in Kazakhstan. Because when people are not uh, sure about the future, about the next day, and when they're busy of earning uh, money for their livings, uh, they are not interested and they are not ready to, uh, to protest uh, because of political reasons. Uh, that's why I don't see uh, in the near future, in the, up, uh, in the aftermath of uh, upcoming elections, in the several years, uh, some mass protests in Kazakhstan. Yes, we'll see some um, upheavals, yes, we'll see some unrest, but they'll not be in the same size uh, as the protests of 2016 or 
uh, after the last presidential elections. Thank you. I mean, that's certainly one way of looking at it, that when people are very concerned with their daily cares and putting bread on the table, that they are much less likely to protest. And together with Assem, with Assem's remarks, that obviously there's also a fear of, of repression. Uh, but on the other hand, we have a question coming in from Sergei Marinin, who says, could perhaps the COVID-19 crisis in, uh, in governments be a triggering factor for potential protests? So the idea that there's uh, greater economic problems, that this in fact might spur people to protest rather than the opposite. Um, Asem, do you have a view on that? Uh, yes, I totally agree with you. Um, uh, I think of course, we the social social economic divide uh, in our society is growing, and you know that our economy is highly dependent on oil, and uh, the state of oil market isn't very good, and of also COVID uh, has affected our economy um, uh, greatly, and I think uh, poverty might be one of the mm, the the only. Poverty is the only reason why people might actually go on the streets. And uh, of course, uh, in comparison to other stunts, uh, we are quite lucky with our oil. Uh, but uh, I think uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, uh, might be uh, one of the, not, not a trigger, but one of the factors uh, because our economy is falling and our government has a lot of, um, you know, the debts. Uh, and I think uh, next year, if uh, we won't have improvements in our economy, uh, that might trigger some actual protests and they'll be more, um, you know, uh, violent than those we have now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, and now turning to a question from James Nixie, who thanks all of our speakers. Uh, can you see any scenario whereby Kazakhstan's foreign policy and foreign relations may change after the elections? Uh, thank you for this question. Mm, I personally don't think that um, we should expect drastic changes in the foreign policy uh, of Kazakhstan. And uh, I, I think that still, uh, it will be still quite favorable to, to Russia uh, because of the background of Tokayev and uh, we still, um, despite so-called quota for the uh, youth and women, we still have quite old Soviet uh, 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 post, uh, uh, people from with a strong um, uh, nostalgia for the Soviet times. And so uh, basically for, for the MPs, uh, I wouldn't also expect that uh, so, so many uh, young people will, will join it. And so uh, in this regard, uh, this uh, Kazakhstan foreign policy will be um, not be really multi-vectoral as it was always uh, described during the Nazarbayev, but uh, be more Rus uh, Russian policy favorable. And I think it's uh, uh, events in Belarus and Kyrgyzstan, it's clear the sign for, for the Russia to activate all the leverages uh, available in Kazakhstan uh, to, keep, uh, to keep the Kazakhstan uh, in Russia's uh, sphere of influence uh, as uh, one of the closest allies. Mm. Uh, Shalkar, would, would you agree that uh, Kazakhstan is destined to follow a more uh, Russo-centric foreign policy path and, and less of a multivectoral one than it has in previous years? Uh, Kazakhstan's foreign policy is basically identified by the executive branch of power, by president, and now uh, by Nazarbayev, first of all, and then Tokayev and Nazarbayev Tokayev both share the same view on foreign policy. Uh, uh, they'll try to do their best to keep uh, the uh, friendship uh, with the Kremlin. And because Russia in our uh, region is a main player in terms of pol politics, in terms of economy, 
Um, and also, uh, our political elite is dependent on Russia. Uh, and the case of Belarus, case of Kyrgyzstan, and uh, showed us that uh, the Kremlin and always, is always be considered by uh, Central Asian regimes as uh, as big brother who can uh, help them to uh, get rid of uh, these Western values of uh, and the some uh, Western values that actually uh, uh, try to challenge their power. And uh, also we don't we don't have to forget that Russian media also plays a great role in terms of uh, uh, sharing, uh, in terms of disseminating uh, Russian propaganda. Um, and our foreign policy uh, officials always uh, try to keep the same path uh, when it comes to international issues with the, the Russian counterparts. Uh, we can see this from the uh, votes um, uh, in, in the UN. Uh, and also we can see uh, from the uh, official statements uh, when it comes to Crimea, when it comes to other issues that uh, related to Kazakhstan and uh, Russia relations. Um, yeah, so the Kazakh parliament uh, doesn't play a crucial role in identifying uh, Kazakhstan's foreign policy. Yeah. It's basically uh, 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 passes the laws, uh, which uh, draft, law drafts that comes from the executive branch. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, we'll see that the foreign policy, uh, which is uh, designed and uh, promoted by Nazarbayev Tokayev, will still be uh, the same. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in, in other words, foreign, the foreign policy of Kazakhstan is really very little dependent on the outcome of the elections, particularly since the uh, ruling Neurotan party is expected to have a, a landslide victory. Um, but this leads me to a question from Alex Folks, who asks, apart from the provisions requiring representation of women and young people, and we know this was a, a move that the government felt that it could you know, very safely make to, to give the uh, impression of change, are there any other positive developments in the election compared with the presidential election 18 months ago? And I'd just like to, to perhaps specify that a bit more in terms of the law and peaceful assemblies. Um, it was the case that uh, you were no longer uh, required to actually ask for permission to hold, to hold a rally. You were supposed to simply be able to to uh, have a rally that, that did not require prior permission. But of course, then we saw that this was not the case at all. And that, that in fact, the, um, the requests to hold rallies were actually much more refused with much greater frequency that uh, there were in fact other um, in, uh, obstacles put in place. So I just, I'd like to ask in this, um, in connection with Alex Folk's question to Shalkar, do you see anything that positive that has come out of the pre-election campaign changes that have been promised by the government? So um, it's really hard to see some positive signs uh, in this political developments in Kazakhstan, but um, by its inaction, uh, by their behavior, the Kazakh government, the current regime showed the Kazakh people that in particular, uh, in in this summer, uh, uh, when so many people died uh, uh, from uh, COVID-19, and there were those long uh, lines uh, in front of uh, drug stores, that uh, the government actually, um, the people were asking, why do we need uh, such kind of government if they don't cannot uh, care of us? And I think it's a very important question that uh, should be asked by all citizens of Kazakhstan uh, to uh, promote promote uh, the conversation on uh, the need uh, of political developments, political changes. Um, and people, even people working for the government, they also try to, to question uh, their role in this regime. But 
unfortunately, it wasn't in the, for the short time of period, but uh, I think it's a, it, it, it will play a great role in terms of uh, mind shifting. People will, uh, will start questioning their uh, role in the government. They will try to question the government's role in their life. And also they will see that with, without political uh, liberalization, without political reforms, we will not see any kind of positive change uh, in terms of our uh, well-being, in terms of uh, power distribution, in terms of uh, wealth distribution, uh, and in terms of uh, healthcare, education. So uh, this is a positive sign that I have seen uh, over the last 18 months that people started uh, uh, asking tough questions uh, from the government. Uh, we see this kind of change uh, trend on social media uh, that people post uh, very critical posts on the Facebook in particular. On YouTube, we can find out a lot of uh, videos by ordinary citizens uh, that challenging the government, local governments and central government organizations to take actions uh, to give them a chance to speak out. And there was some uh, local protests in regions and all these kind of uh, changes uh, I consider as a positive sign in terms of uh, political development in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's, that's an interesting point. The, the idea that uh, officials are, now asking, are posing much more difficult questions. You've got uh, bloggers that are asking much more difficult questions than they did before. These sort of changes at the grassroots level and, and even in the echelons of power. Um, might we interpret from this, might we draw the conclusion from this, that although protests are likely to be very contained and, and circumscribed in number this January, that this is perhaps the beginning of a larger trajectory, that you see that indeed the genie has been let out of the bottle, one that can't be put back so easily, and that this sort Sort of protest sentiment will continue to grow. Um, would you agree with that, Danya? Yes, uh, I would agree on that. Uh, the, um, it will be growing uh, grievances um, among the population and uh, total dissatisfaction with the with the functioning of the of the healthcare authorities and also uh, Minister of Education. Uh, Put um, uh, was under attack of the citizens with the distant uh, education measures. Um, so, uh, yeah, of course, I think um, uh, that's why Nazarbayev uh, made a really wise uh, turn that he's uh, kind of mm, um, stood away from the from the consequences uh, that. Uh, that now he's uh, he's not uh, actual president and but still constrains the power and uh, all the uh, uh, all these uh, grievances should be addressed uh, to the current president. So it will be interesting also observe uh, this uh, uh, this uh, thing of the responsibilities uh, for for the outcomes of the. Uh, COVID, uh, COVID crisis. Mm. Okay, thank you. And, and Assam, would you agree that this is the beginning of a trajectory in which we'll see growing uh, protest sentiment and, and activism in Kazakhstan, particularly as it looks around to its neighbors? Uh, in some ways, of course, uh, uh, I agree with, uh, with this, but uh, I don't think it's uh, the, the, the reason for that would be our neighbor countries, because Kyrgyzstan has been some kind of a scarecrow for Kazakhstan for many years. Um, you know, our government uh, uh, has been using Kyrgyzstan as a you know, bad example uh, for many years. So a lot of people, I think, agree, uh, believe that. But uh, we're all, uh, you know, we're all looking uh, at Belarus at the moment, and we all were all wishing them uh, all the best because if uh, you know, if they will be, you know, it's 124th day of their protest uh, as of, as for today, and if they, you know, um, finally 
uh, manage uh, to overthrow Lukashenko, then uh, it might mean that we might have a chance to do something like that as well in our country. So, yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question here from the Norwegian ambassador, John Mikhail Kvistad. Um, are there any comments uh, from any of our speakers on key political prisoners in Kazakhstan at the moment? It's a bit off of the question of parliamentary elections, but, but nonetheless, um, Shakar Danyar Assem, do you have any information on key political prisoners in Kazakhstan at the moment? Mm -hmm. uh, if I can name a few, of course, it's Aron Atabek, uh, who's been in jail since uh, early 2000s, uh, 2004, I think. And now we have um, new political prisoners, uh, Sanavar Zakirova, who tried to uh, create her, her own political party. And now she's in jail for a year, I think. Uh, and of course, um, who else? Uh, Aigul, um, I forgot her last name, uh, who also, um, who is a, um, uh, blogger and he had she had uh, she was very active on Facebook and now she's in uh, she's in prison as well and also we have few more bloggers um, uh, one blogger from Karaganda uh, as you might know we have this new law uh, not not a new law we have this law um, uh, which you know um, not not uh, it, it is against the law to criticize Yelbase, the Sultan Nazarbayev. So we have uh, one blogger, one blogger who's been jailed for criticizing Nazarbayev last year, and he's in jail for three years now. But I think Shalkar have more information on that. Shalkar, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, recently, I saw I saw a Facebook post of um, Tori Gojima. Uh, she posted. Uh, some information about Max Bokaev, and he's one of the main political prisoners in Kazakhstan. And um, I see him as a potential political leader in Kazakhstan after his uh, release. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he'll be released next year because he was jailed for five years after the land reforms uh, protests. Um, and I hope that uh, everything will be fine with him, with his health, first of all. And uh, uh, the Kazakh government, of course, will uh, be closely mon monitoring his activities. Uh, and uh, they're very uh, aware of his uh, potential. And I'm not sure he'll, if he will be involved in politics uh, after his release from the jail. Um, and um, yeah, as I already mentioned, uh, some uh, names. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know uh, a lot of names. Yes, we have uh, many political prisoners in Kazakhstan, but unfortunately, I don't know all these names. But um, international organizations, human rights watch organizations, and all international organizations have their own list. Mm -hmm. And I agree that we always have to uh, put their names in the spotlight in order to make sure that they will be released as soon as possible, because no one should be uh, mm -hmm. prosecuted uh, for having their own opinion uh, on the political develop developments in Kazakhstan. Uh, thank you. We're, we've just got a few minutes left now, and so I'd like to get this one uh, last question in, because Shokar, you spent quite a bit of time uh, delineating to us the differences between the various parties that are registered. And so just for the record, so we're clear on this, do any of the parties' stated programs differ from each other? This is a question from Nargiza Muratalieva. Um, and if yes, what are these differences? Can they be categorized? And actually, I would add, do they really matter? Do we really have any parties that are registered that could make a difference? It could be that party that you're referring to that might actually unite and lead in opposition. Yeah. First, um, besides Rotan, Rotan uh, considers itself, promotes itself as a centrist party. And Agjol uh, promotes itself as a party of business. And the of uh, uh, as a party of business and uh, business owners, and also we have Owl, which is also participated as a party of uh, farmers, small businesses, and Adal, also the uh, party of business 
and people uh, living in villages. So Awul, Akjol, uh, Awul, Akjol, and Adal, they are all the same when it comes to the ideology. They're trying to promote the people uh, business interests and the interests of people living in rural areas. And Northern is a party of everything. They care about uh, people living in all regions of Kazakhstan, uh, people of all these uh, colors, races, uh, Russian speaking people, Kazakh speaking people. And uh, there's a interesting case with the party of uh, Kazakhstan People's Party, which is previously was uh, rebranded, uh, previously was promoted as a, par a party of uh, Kazakhstan uh, Communist People's Party. But it's unclear if they uh, still uh, adhere to the communist idea or not. So it's unclear. Right. OK, well, thank you. Well, we're running out of time. Uh, unfortunately, that was a, a wonderful discussion, the best I've heard on the upcoming elections. I'd like to give the last word to my co-chair, Abakhan Sultan Nazarov. Um, but before we turn to him, I'd just like to thank the panelists once again for their insights and their thoughts, and, and also to remark that it's been a real pleasure to work with IWPR. Uh, we really appreciate the way that you've all shared your thoughts and ideas. We look forward to keeping in touch and to continuing the dialogue. Um, so now over to Bahan for brief closing remarks. Thank you very much, Hanit. I apologize with my voice. Uh, uh, I feel a little bit unwell. I really enjoyed this incredible event. You know, I hope you did too. I had a great pleasure listening to all of you. Uh, I'm thankful to everyone who joined this event. Uh, today we could uh, cons uh, we consider it the upcoming parliamentary election from different perspectives. Uh, from the perspectives of the very parties, from the legal perspective. And we could touch upon the issue mass protest and many other aspects. I would like to thank our speakers, Shalkar, for sharing his vision of the election and providing broad background on Nuratan and other political parties. Asim, for walking us through the opposition. And Dania, for reflecting on the observations missions. And of course, special thanks to our great host, Annette Bohr, for the great job for facilitating this discussion. I hope that this discussion contributed to fresh thinking about the developments in the biggest Central Asian country, Kazakhstan. I hope our discussion today became, uh, uh, really our discussion today became possible due to our experts, our great partner, Chatham House, IWVR team. Of course, support of the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. I hope you found this event interesting and enjoyed it. Thank you for your time, for your time and participation. All right, thank you, Abba Khan. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye and see you soon. Thank you very much, all. Thank you.